the narcissist's army. Whilst we consider ourselves omnipotent, mighty, and all-conquering, it remains the fact that we are unable to do much of what is required to assert control, gather our fuel, execute our machinations, and gather those character traits and residual benefits without the assistance of our supporters. These are the people that form the narcissist's army. Gaining supporters is important to us, and it's not difficult for us to do so. Much in the same way that we seduce and install a person as the primary source, we seduce people to become our supporters, fitting in as secondary sources. What does it take to become one of the supporters of the narcissist? Well, we must be able to, of course, control you. You need to be able to provide us with fuel. That is paramount, and something that we expect from all those who recruit to be our supporters. We will take character traits from you, and residual benefits. Those residual benefits mean that we require the supporters' obedience, that we require them to speak well of us, to others, i.e. the facade, and accept our views over those advanced by other people. We want you to provide us with character traits that we can purloin for ourselves and pass them off as our own to the rest of the world. We want you to carry out our orders. Not everybody that we recruit is able to carry out these requirements, and therefore this results in us having different classifications of supporter. Remember that this active recruitment for the purpose of the prime aims is done in an aware manner, where the narcissist is an aware one, namely greater or ultra. However, the vast majority of narcissists are unaware, being lesser or mid-range, and therefore, whilst they too, of course, recruit supporters into the army, that is, that of the narcissist's army, and do so in differing ways, they do so unaware of the real reason that they are doing it. They believe that they want some help. They don't realise that this is a ritual with benefit. They do so in order to ensure that that person supports them. They don't realise that that is the assertion of control and that there will be the provision of fuel. Where do these supporters come from? When you first become entangled with our kind, in a romantic ensnarement, you will notice that certain narcissists have family, friends, colleagues and acquaintances who think highly of us. That is invariably mid-range, greater and ultra. It can be with some lessers, although the factious relationships that exist between lessers and their secondary sources can be a little more obvious. There will be occasions when someone who appears to be a stranger will stop and say hello to us on the street. We receive particularly good service from a waitress who evidently knows who we are. Our supporters are drawn from everyone around us. They do not all have to be friends with us. Many supporters remain in the ranks of acquaintances, colleagues and minions, without ever advancing to the status of being an inner or outer circle friend. But for every category of proximity of the provision of fuel that exists, those people are our supporters. There will invariably be an impressive infrastructure of supporters in place when we first interact, but it won't end there. We also want your supporters to become our supporters. Of course, those, support, those who support you are your supporters for completely different reasons to our supporters, but that doesn't matter. Your supporters, at least initially, will also be subjected to the charm, pleasantness, kindness and magnetism of varying degrees in order to draw them into our sphere of influence and anoint them as one of our supporters. We don't recognise the boundaries. We don't recognise that these are your friends and that they are necessarily to be utilised for the purposes of our assertion of control. No. They are fair game. We regard it as fundamental that we endeavour to recruit your supporters to be ours. Not all narcissists succeed, and of course, those of your supporters, which perhaps are less enamoured with us, maybe even suspect there is something not quite right, are painted black, and we will do our best then in order to nullify the threat to control that they pose by isolating you through from these traitorous individuals. 
monopolizing your time so you can't time spend with them, pouring scorn on what they say, telling lies to you about how we regard them in order to drive a wedge between you and certain friends and family members if we are not able to get them on side. At first, it's not a mutually exclusive arrangement. Indeed, since you are firmly in the golden period, then it is easy for these people to support you and us. It is once the devaluation begins, where you are an intimate partner primary source, or if you're receiving corrective devaluations as a secondary source, and especially when smearing occurs, that the value of your supporters to us becomes even greater. It is then that those supporters show their true worth to our kind by altering the way that they deal with you and or refusing to alter the way that they deal with us. We will always aim, either in an unaware or an aware manner, to recruit from within your ranks. So, what are the categories that we classify our supporters into? The facade. I regularly make mention of how the maintenance of the facade is important. Mid-range and greater narcissists and the ultra want the world to think that we are kind, wonderful, interesting, charming, generous, superior, and an all-round decent person. There are differing facades that exist dependent upon the type of narcissist that you're dealing with. So some mid-range narcissists will operate a facade of helpfulness, the overwhelming angel, for example, by reason of the middle-middle-range type A. Upper mid-range is more about a facade of effectiveness and superiority. With the greaters and the ultra, it might be extensive philanthropy, huge amounts of charm, off-the-scale grandiosity, backed up by demonstrative examples, a facade of capability, of superiority that draws people to us. Those people who are assigned to the facade serve a purpose as creating that facade, which we can then use to triangulate against other people for the purpose of control. The people in the facade also provide us with control, fuel, character traits and residual benefits. The facade is supported by a vast array of people, ranging from family, friends, colleagues, all the way through to even strangers. We also want all of your supporters to buy into this as well, as a minimum, so that when the time comes when we devalue you, and smear you, and possibly disengage from you, you find that you run into a wall of unimpeachable individuals who all believe that we would never hurt you, that we are a decent individual, and therefore you must be making it up exaggerating, or perhaps taking things out of proportion. The Coterie. This is our stable of highly visible supporters. They can be relied on to provide us with fuel, more often and to a greater degree than those who are in the facade. This group will contain people who can provide us with those character traits that we like to steal. They invariably believe everything that we say, and are very difficult to persuade that the facade is just an illusion. They would gladly do things for us, and they do so not necessarily born out of threat or inducement, but because they like us, because they have become in effect brainwashed by us, and they will do things of their own volition, motivated by the fact that they are protective towards us. We do not regard their loyalty and blind obedience to be that great. However, if we ask them to tell the world how great we are, they will in effect do so. If we want to borrow money, get a lift somewhere, have them pick up a parcel and so forth, they will really do so. The Coterie can often be a competitive place, where its members vie against one another for our favour, in order to show that they get to spend longer with us, or time with us alone, or that we have praised them over someone else. The Coterie can be relied on to always agree with us, disagree with you, laugh at our jokes, stand and listen to our anecdotes, and marvel at our magnificence. The Coterie will embrace you warmly when we begin our seduction of you, but do not be fooled. None of them truly like you. They only pretend to do so in order to gain our favour. They are envious, because they want to be our favourite. They want to be primary source. They don't know what a primary source is in the same way that you don't, but they want to be regarded in the same way as the way that we regard you during the seduction. The promise of a more intense golden period to one that they already enjoy as a secondary source often keeps them in line, 
Imagine, if you will, a royal court. And these courtiers are always to hand, gossiping, scheming and pretending in order to gain some royal grace and favour from their monarch, as when we give the signal, this group of people will turn their backs on you, happily disseminate our propaganda about you and support our smearing of you. The coterie can consist, of course, of other narcissists, normals and indeed empaths, whose emotional empathy towards you becomes reduced as a consequence of an external stressor, namely misinformation. If we keep telling the coterie that you're abusing us, if we keep telling the coterie that you're a horrible person, they will invariably believe it. Why would they believe to the contrary? We've always been decent towards them, and indeed in some instances, those that exhibit envy want to hear that things aren't going particularly well for you. Those are already, those are normally, of course, the normals and the narcissists that were thinking that way, but even some empaths could do that as a consequence of the reduction of their emotional empathy. The Turncoat Coterie. This group is similar to the Coterie, but contains those people who were once your supporters. Initially, the person is admitted to our Coterie because they are content to support both you and I during the Golden Period, and therefore there's no difficulty. This person ends up being earmarked, either consciously or unconsciously, by the narcissist for the turn turncoat coterie because they naturally promote the facade, but they want more. These individuals actually end up contacting us and not you. They talk to us without you being around. And as time progresses, we ensure that their loyalty to us becomes greater than their loyalty to you. To put it in your parlance, they start off as one of your friends, become both our friends, and then decide that they want to be our friend, rather than remain friends with you. This person's status is never apparent until it is time for them to make a choice between you and I, which is usually around the time of the smearing and disengagement. They will not actively do anything against you, but they will promote what we say to others, and end up turning their back upon you when we decree that ought to be done. And again, that arrives as a consequence of their own decision-making. They do so of their own volition, following the repeated smearing that occurs. Not only, of course, do we revel in such a recruitment since it bothers, bolsters the number of our supporters, but it also means that you will be controlled by their treachery, and this provides us with fuel and emphasises our power. Lieutenants. The agents who believe what we say remain loyal and carry out demands in order to retain our favour and receive other tokens of our appreciation and largesse. Our lieutenants are not only those who will provide us with fuel, carry out favours for us, but they will actively assist us in our machinations. Whether it is finding out information about a prospective target before we engage, administering one of our devaluing manipulations by proxy, or utilising the lieutenant in a hoover, these in effect are the elite of our supporters. They may not number many in nature, and they don't know what they are. And, invariably, of course, they don't know what we are, other than they often regard us as a brilliant and magnetic person, a solid friend, somebody that they like. We will have invariably undertaken favours for them in order to secure their loyalty. We may also have some dirt on them, which can be used in certain instances to apply pressure if we have any concerns that their loyalty is wavering, and thus we can manipulate them accordingly, often with the use of threat, where mid-range narcissist, with the greater and the ultra, an implicit indication that it would be unwise for them to step out of line. The lieutenant, of course, can be called on for fuel in times of emergency, to assist in smearing, to gather information for us, and to remain under control and loyal. We often endeavour to keep one lieutenant that you don't actually know about, so that he or she can be used with impunity, often during a hoover, this behaviour usually exhibited by greater or the ultra. Unaware that this particular person is connected to us, your defences will be lowered, and then this allows our lieutenant to acquire information from you and to initiate contact to enable us to improve the prospects of hoovers succeeding. Of course, this is planned activity, and therefore falls within the remit of the greater and the ultra. You may find that not long after you have escaped the narcissist that you are approached by someone who seems interested in you romantically. There is a good chance that this person is a hitherto unknown lieutenant of ours. Not only does this improve the Hoover prospects, but if you happen to succumb to it and later escape or evade it in the first place, and realise that a lieutenant was involved, 
This will cause you to remain anxious about anybody else who engages with you romantically. This causes you to struggle to move forward and find someone new who will distract you from thinking about us. Finally, we have the turncoat lieutenant, the ultimate supporter. This person is a friend or family member of yours who you think that you can rely on and trust, but in actual fact they are loyal to us. And not only that, they are actually briefling against you. It is this person who enables us to acquire your new mobile telephone number after you've changed it post-escape. It is this person who tells us where you've moved to, where you will be on a particular evening, and who you are fraternising with, in order to maximise our attempts to hoover you. This person will operate on our behalf, so that during devaluation, when you are seeking solace from them and trying to understand what is happening, this turncoat lieutenant will be advancing reasons which support our position and undermine yours. You can expect them to say things to you such as, Are you sure that's what really happened? I think you're overreacting, to be honest. Maybe if you tried X or Y, he'll calm down. Well, is it any wonder he does this? He works really hard. Perhaps he's stressed out. That isn't something you should be worrying about, trust me. You're becoming fixated with something that isn't a problem. You know he does a lot for you. Often you don't know about it and you should be grateful. I find that hard to believe. He's always fine with me. He wouldn't mean what you're thinking. I think you're seeing something which isn't there. Take it from me. I know she has your best interests at heart. If you start hearing comments from somebody in your family or a friend that you regard as more to be your friend than ours, or at least started off as your friend, and comments which sound as if they could be uttered by our kind, there is a good chance that you're dealing with a turncoat lieutenant. Often this individual has fallen for the lies that we have told about you, and, where relevant, the charm that has been sent in their direction. If this person is of the opposite sex, or same if we have that particular sexual orientation, there is a good chance that they may well become your replacement, and that is their reward for their loyalty to us and betrayal of your you. They will be able to, we will be able to replace you as our primary source and as our intimate partner. This person will advance any smears against you and also persuade others amongst your supporters that we are right and you are wrong, causing confusion and doubt. Their impact is significant, and we always aim to recruit such a person, either, as mentioned, consciously where greater are ultra, or unconsciously where lesser or mid-range. Of course, your higher echelon narcissists are much more able to do this. A turncoat lieutenant will often remain undetected, waiting for when we need in effect to activate them, and then they have the potential to cause havoc in your camp, undermining you to others, turning people against you, and having you doubt yourself. A turncoat lieutenant is a dangerous weapon once recruited by us. These are the main constituent parts of our army. Which of those have you come across? Have you lost a friend that you thought was a good friend, only to find out that they moved to the side of the narcissist? And if so, do you know how that happened? And what did you do? Do share your experiences in the comments. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.